Good evening, this is Frank Knight. During the past four years, the Longines Whitnor Watch Company has presented 600 programs of the Longines Chronoscope. Now this week, due to a change in the programming structure of the CBS television network, the present series of Chronoscope programs come to an end. For our last three programs, tonight, Wednesday and Friday, we bring back on film some of the distinguished guests of the Longines Chronoscope. This in the nature of a report of four years of public service programming. Chapter one of this chronoscope report to viewers presents the late Senator Robert A. Taft, the then Governor Earl Warren, Senators McCarthy and Watkins, industrialist Henry Ford II, AF of L President George Meany, and Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt. Now here's our editor-in-chief, the noted news analyst, Larry LeSeur. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Today history is practically written in minutes, so we've turned back our Longines clock to reveal for you some of the climactic moments in the lives of past Chronoscope guests. Back in June 1951, when Chronoscope first started, Eisenhower was in uniform, and the world wondered whether he would accept a very evident draft to run for the presidency of the United States. But there were others at home who had already declared their ambition, and among the most memorable and outstanding of them was the man from Ohio, the late Senator Robert A. Taft. Mr. Republican, they called him, and he made a gallant run for the presidential nomination, and he was an even more gallant loser. Since his untimely death, no one has taken his place. Some of our viewers may recall when, before the convention, he was asked on Chronoscope, Senator Taft, why do you think you can win? Republican can win. I think they certainly can this year. Uh, I, was, I ran in Ohio last year, in 1950, which, uh, on the same issues, I had the opposition of Mr. Truman, I think almost every member of Mr. Truman's cabinet, the opposition of the CIO, the AFL, that is the leaders of them, not the men I found before I got through. And uh, I carried the uh, Ohio as a typical state. Uh, it's a very fair cross section of uh, industry, of agriculture, of every other feature of American life. And I carried the state by 431,000, yes, which is the largest amount that a senator had ever carried it by. Uh, I got, I think we figured about 40% of the labor union vote. Uh, I received a much larger percentage, of course, of other votes. And I see no reason whatever why the same methods pursued uh, throughout the nation wouldn't be, have the same effect. Another presidential aspirant in 1951 is today the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. And only recently he took the occasion to declare he would not be a candidate in 1956. But when Chronoscope first began, Governor Earl Warren thought his destiny might lead to the White House, and California backed him to the hilt. You may remember when he was asked, Governor Warren, both Eastern and Midwestern Republicans wonder just how it is you get so many Republican and Democratic votes. Are you a staunch Republican? I, I think that I am. I think our people perhaps are, are a little less uh, <coughs> Uh, party-minded out in the West than they than they are in the East and the and the Middle West, but uh, Republicans in our part of the country uh, think the same and act very much the same as they do in other parts of it. But we we have Republicans out there who would like to turn the clock back if they could, and uh, but I don't happen to be one of those. I believe that this country was built on faith and not uh, on fear. And I believe that if we have faith in our institutions, uh, we can believe that there isn't any problem before the American people that cannot be solved by, by our system, the, is the greatest system that's ever been devised by man. But I believe that some of these people who, who uh, use the word socialism very lightly these days and very uh, often uh, are unable to distinguish between socialism and and social progress. You spoke of the, the speech that I made last night at, at Boston. In preparing that speech, I found a, a little expression of Abraham Lincoln who, that reminded me of such people. That he spoke of a type of thinking that could not distinguish between a horse chestnut and a chestnut horse. The most controversial figure in the country was the freshman senator from Wisconsin, Joseph R. McCarthy. The word McCarthyism had not yet been coined when he was interviewed on Chronoscope in early 1952. But you may recall when McCarthy was asked, have you made any plans if the Republicans win the Senate in the November elections? Let me say this, that uh, 
If the Republicans should take over the Senate, I happen to be the ranking <coughs> member on the investigating committee. That means that McCarthy would become chairman of the Senate investigating committee. And if, if he does, I'll, I'll make you one promise, that Leavenworth won't hold them. You're going to use the same tactics that you've used right along, sir. Oh, now, when you say the same tactics, you see, if you, if you have a committee, the power to subpoena investigators, mm -hmm. you don't use the same tactics you use when you have no, no uh, committee, no power to subpoena, where you've got to dig and root out the communists and the crooks and those who are bad for America. Yes. Where, you, where you have a committee, uh, so that you have the power of subpoena, you can get the records, and if we have a Republican president, uh, we'll be able to get those records, I'm sure. Uh, it will be uh, a less spectacular fight, but much more effective. You see, it's, it's difficult when you're all alone uh, with uh, the entire power of this federal bureaucracy against you, difficult to dig them out. Even at that, you see, we have uh, exposed, gotten out of government 11 uh, of those I originally named. Some, of, some of them have been convicted, <coughs> others before the grand jury, but all out of the government under the loyalty program. Nobody can foresee the future. The controversy over Senator McCarthy assumed international proportions. The Army McCarthy hearing rocked the nation. Finally, the Senate appointed a select committee headed by the staunchly conservative but little publicized Senator from Utah, Arthur P. Watkins, and it delivered its verdict with the full support of the Senate. That week, I asked Senator Watkins on Chronoscope if he could predict what might happen to a senator who had been censured by his colleagues. Uh, anything much to go by as far as history is concerned. We've only had, as I recall, three times. One of the senators uh, didn't run again, another one resigned, and uh, one uh, was re-elected, but he wasn't very active after that time. It depends upon the senator. Some senators would feel very sensitive about it and feel that they'd been rebuked and probably wouldn't want to stay in the Senate. Other men who feel that probably they were just and right, uh, they were doing the right thing, they may want to fight it out and go on to greater activity. In the case of uh, Senator McCarthy, he's a young man, a lot of vigor and uh, with a lot of ability. I think if he would uh, take the lesson to heart now and go to work uh, in a field that uh, would not provoke so much controversy and follow the, uh, the uh, policies or the philosophy laid down in the censure hearings, I think he could accomplish a great deal. We turned the chronoscope cameras toward the great automobile industry and one of its outstanding leaders. Henry Ford II has rarely appeared on television, but last year the young automobile industrialist agreed to appear on chronoscope. And we asked Mr. Ford what many persons felt at that time. Had this country reached the saturation point in the number of automobiles on the road? <laughs> on Sunday night in this area are really crowded. But I honestly think that uh, with uh, uh, an expanded sales organization and with the products which our industry has to sell that there's a great opportunity for us to do an even greater job than we've been able to do up to this point. Uh, I think we haven't really gotten into the really possibilities that are available for our industry. There are many families which don't own cars that can afford to own cars and there are many families that can afford to have two cars that only have one car. Well, Mr. Ford, what about the, uh, if I may say so, the automobile dealers? Aren't they screaming now about having too many cars in their hands? Many dealers, many dealers are. I think many dealers are really worried that the, the manufacturers are turning out too many cars. I think that uh, since the war, the, the dealers really haven't had uh, a competitive situation to face. And I know that they all want to face that situation, and now we're in it. And uh, so they've got to go out and sell, and I'm sure that the manufacturers as such want to treat them in the best way they possibly can, because no manufacturer is any better than his dealer organization. The cost of living was going up last year, and labor showed signs of restlessness. So we asked Henry Ford if he were concerned about the increasing differential between wages and the rising cost of living. I, I not sure that I can answer that uh, question, Mr. Lesser, in, uh, in the most economic sense. We in our business have a cost of living index, which is measured on the cost of living. And uh, as such, uh, we pay wages in accordance with the rise or the lowering of the cost of living. Uh, and uh, we will do that until our contract runs out in 1955. Uh, and that's our contract, so we're forced into it. 
and we're very willing and, and happy to live by it. From big business, we went to big unions. When AFL president George Meany appeared on Chronoscope last year, the AFL and the CIO were separate. Now they've agreed to merge, subject to the ratification of their national conventions. And George Meany is the favorite to head this super union. In 1954, we asked Mr. Meany just what organized labor looked forward to in the years to come. We want a fair share of the things that we produce. We want, uh, we want a better America. We want better houses, better homes for the people of America, better educational opportunities for the American people. And uh, we want these things in whatever type of economy uh, that we're going to have in the years to come. And we want, uh, we want uh, a fair share, as I said, of the things we produce, and we want it in the pay envelope, and we want the pay envelope to be able to, pr pr to, to purchase those things which we consider our fair share of the national Does this mean you're going to fight for a guaranteed wage? <coughs> no, that means we're going to, we're going to fight for uh, as much uh, wages that, uh, as, as we feel we're entitled to in, in, in the various industries and for whatever job security we can possibly get. No chronoscope series was ever complete without the presence of the former first lady. And the name of Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt is indelibly associated with the United Nations. And since every big and little world crisis is tossed over to the UN to settle, we're often disappointed when the 60 sovereign nations can't agree on a positive answer. Is this an integral fault of the United Nations, we asked Mrs. Roosevelt? We started out expecting that the United Nations would solve every difficulty right just by being the United Nations. We didn't realize that the United Nations was only all the nations gathered in one place, but all the troubles remained, just as they were before. And therefore, we had to work to make the United Nations work. And we didn't want to work. And we didn't expect to have to do this work. And now we know we have to, which is healthy, I think. This has been Chapter 1 of the Longines Chronoscope's Report to Viewers. You've met seven among the hundreds of important men and women, members of Congress, cabinet officers, governors of state, who have spoken on national affairs during the past four years on the Longines Chronoscope. Chapter two of the report to viewers of Chronoscope will be presented on Wednesday. We'll bring back some of the important international figures who've discussed the foreign relations of the United States from Korea onward. We hope you'll be with us. Thank you, Larry Lasser. The Longines Whitnor Watch Company tonight omits its regular commercial announcement. We remind you only that our two prize-winning watches, Longines and Whitnor, are sold and serviced in all the countries of the free world and in the United States by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display the emblem agency for Longines Whitnor watches. The termination on Friday evening of this long series of Longines Chronoscope programs is made necessary because of the desire of the CBS television network to rearrange its television programming, a step which we sincerely regret. Nevertheless, we would like to express our appreciation for the fine cooperation given by the technical and the editorial staffs of CBS, which has contributed so materially to the success of our programs. Now, over the years, we've received many thousands of communications from you, our viewers, substantial evidence that the Longine Chronoscope has served the public interest. Your views are always welcome. And if at this time you'd like to express your comments, simply address Longine, 580 5th Avenue, New York 36. Wednesday at this time, Mr. Lesser will present Chapter 2 of Longine Chronoscope's Report to Viewers, an exciting look at the foreign relations of our country over the past four years. This is Frank Knight speaking.